Hi, this is Micah Gallo, a previous participant in Popcorn Frights with my film Itsy Bitsy. And we're here with Patrick Ray and his exciting new film. How are you doing, Patrick? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. Well, I've got my uh, Joe Bob Briggs shirt on. I should have wore mine. I have I one got a beer. <laughs> so uh, feeling good. That's feeling awesome. Fun. That's awesome. Um, I'm here in California. Where are you? I am in Kansas City, Missouri, actually. So, and awesome. uh, you know, we shot the movie actually partially in Kansas City and then partially in Topeka, Kansas. So, okay, yeah, yeah. I, I was curious, you know, how much of the. It, it seems like it's mostly found locations, but I was wondering if the basement was a location or a set. No, it was actually the 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 basement was really part of the house, and that was kind of what sold us on the house too, because. Um, I had the, I'm friends with the owner of that house and it's kind of like 20 minutes outside of Topeka, Kansas. It's a very kind of isolated farm and nobody had lived there since like 2004 or 2005. So she was preparing to renovate the house and sell it. It was her, uh, I think father's house. And um, she reached out to me and she's like, I have this, this ranch with this house. Do you have a film that in mind that you could, you know, shoot here? And I'm like, as a matter of fact, I do. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, we were lucky enough to get that location and it was just the right level of creepy and yet not like so unsanitary that we couldn't actually film there. But, yeah. uh, you know, the basement had um, we found a long snake skin in the basement. And I, I remember the crew was like, where's the snake? <laughs> so nobody <laughs> wanted to actually go in the in the basement. To, uh to film but we uh but we made it what work. was with that bathtub it looked like the bathtub from the shining or something yeah that was you know again there were large spiders in that bathtub before the actors actually got inside of it so um we had to do a little bit of cleaning to make it work because we were going to be there for 10 days and so um but i said don't clean it too much because it's got to look like it's you know been abandoned for a long time so yeah it felt that way it certainly yeah. felt really abandoned yeah and you know i i was kind of I don't know if this was a coincidence, but I was thinking that Mark put us together because both of our films, you know, my film, Itsy Bitsy, and yeah. really both of your films, which, I mean, first of all, you've, uh, I, I looked at your IMDb, you've directed 72 projects. Am I getting that right? Yeah, I mean, a lot of those are short films. Um, my most recent features, actually, I had um, uh, a film called Nailbiter, which actually also mostly took place in the cellar. And um, then I did a film called Enclosure that starred Fiona Dorff and Jake Busey. But then when mm. it was released, it was called Arbor Demon. And then uh, and then I am Lisa. Um, and now and now, of course, they wait in the dark. Yeah. And three well, so of, I, three of those I've seen I am here. Lisa. Yeah. And I've seen this film. And, you know, in both cases, it's a relationship drama first and right. horror second in a way, Correct. Um, Correct. which is similar to the film I made for better or worse, which I, I was wondering, maybe that's why Mark linked us up. I don't know. I'm theorizing. Uh, as filmmakers do. We right? do have a mutual friend as well. I think uh, my friend Ron Hurley worked on your movie. and did. did yeah, you Ron Hurley. Right. And Ron yeah. Hurley, Ron Hurley, uh, mo like on a weekly basis, has to walk me through computer problems. But he's done he's done visual effects on several of my films, and he, he's very based cool. out of Colorado. Very so. cool. Yeah, very nice guy. Yes, yes, very nice guy. And and he he helped out. You know, you know how it is being an independent filmmaker, yeah. kind of at the bitter end. You're trying to get these random shots that whoever didn't do, right? Now you right. got to get them done. You got to get them over the uh, hump. Yeah. Yeah, and well, Ron Ron was a huge help there. Absolutely. So, Maybe we could kind of start from the beginning of your okay. process, because I'm kind of curious, you know, how do you go about the writing process when when you set out to write a new project or when you set out to write this project? How did that go? I wanted to make a haunted house movie, but I wanted to make a haunted house movie that was a little different. Um, and it's really hard to come up with a concept that has kind of a new vantage point. Um, that's a haunted house movie because everything's been done to death. And so my idea was to combine domestic thriller with a haunted house movie. So there are two threats, one that's very real and very relatable to a lot of people. And then you've got the supernatural element. So the, the main character of Amy and her son, Adrian feel almost like they're sandwiched between a, like a threat on the outside that they're hiding from. And then the threat that's on the inside. So um, I felt like that was an original vantage point to make a haunted house movie and also i mean 
I'm always thinking, because I'm an independent filmmaker like yourself, I'm always thinking, how do I make this movie with relatively few locations, you know, and, and be able to accomplish this this movie on a uh, on a small budget? Um, yeah. And for instance, I Am Lisa had like 13 or 14 locations, and we shot that movie in 14 days. And this movie, I had 12 days to shoot. So I was like, okay, I want to try to keep, you know, obviously the schedule is tight, the budget is tight. I can't have more than maybe three or four locations to do this right. So um, we were lucky enough to get the house. And obviously that was the majority of our, our schedule. So you but had that during the writing process? Did you already have the house? She had proposed that location to me for several projects. And finally, I'm like, so I'm you gonna, were picturing I'm gonna write it something. Yeah. You wrote I, it. And she was sending me photos because uh, I hadn't actually gone out there. She had sent me photos while I was writing it. And we weren't 100% sure we were going to use it because... Um, and like you understand, obviously, you got a um, company moves and everyone's in Kansas City. Topeka is about an hour or 20 minutes away. So I had to figure out, OK, am I going to be able to afford getting people hotels in Topeka for those those set of days? Or do I need to find a location in Kansas City? We were not able to find something better in Kansas City. So we basically were like, look, we can either rent a house and make it look like it's disheveled or we can use this disheveled house save the money on basically art department and spend that money on hotels and get people to stay in Topeka. So there was kind of a, we were weighing our options there. The only real location we had in Kansas city was the diner. Mm -hmm. and that was 10 minutes from my house. And it was kind of a lucky find because I, a lot of diners had been used in Kansas city and, and this was still during the pandemic. So a lot of them did not want films being shot there. So I was able to kind of walk into this diner and I kept bringing my kids because they were kind of like the bait. I was like, if I bring my cute kids, they're not going to be able to tell me no on making a movie at their at their diner. So um, we shot one day at the diner and then we did one day at a gas station in Leavenworth, Kansas, where they have the big prison. And then we had, I think, one day kind of like on some country roads to shoot all that stuff. And then we had the rest of the the, the schedule in Topeka. So, um, so then the, all, all the rest of the crew, we just had to stay in Topeka, Kansas for that duration. Got it. Yeah. And, and just, you know, going back to the writing for a minute, because obviously mm -hmm. you're very pro, you're a prolific writer. I mean, you have a lot of projects. Okay. And so I'm wondering, like, really about that writing process, how, how often do you write? Do you write daily? And do you do outlines or how do you approach? I, I'm constantly writing and I have, I, you know, the, the thing is that like, I kind of cover all parts of the process. So um, I handled the editing on this film too. And I edited, I am Lisa as well. Um, so I'm always like, if I'm not doing one thing, I'm in a different part of the process, but it's interesting. Cause I'm, I'm already starting to formulate another movie idea that I want to shoot. And so I've started doing the character breakdown and that's kind of how I start. I, I start coming up with what the characters are about and their motivations and a little bit of backstory to each of these characters before I start writing the screenplay. And most of the time I will write a treatment out that kind of breaks down the three act structure of the story, but I don't get so detailed. I let some of that uh, happen while I'm actually writing the script. And in the, in the case of they wait in the dark, um, I partnered with um, my producer, Megan Flynn, and she and I have been friends uh, since 2008. We worked on a short film together, and she actually was a producer on a family film that I directed uh, several years ago. And so she she kind of came to me and she says, I want to do a project. I want to produce it. Um, obviously, she's like, keep it within this 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 size of a budget. And she's like, can you do it in 12 days? So I started kind of, you know, formulating my haunted house story didn't want to do more than four characters and i wanted to really you know build those characters up and create a cool backstory um but ultimately i wanted to you know every haunted house movie i'm always wondering when i watch it why do these people not just leave you know and and one of my favorite movies of all time is poltergeist which poltergeist mm -hmm. it has the perfect motivation for staying in the house which is we can't find our daughter the only way we can yeah. communicate with her is through the television Right. And in the case of this movie, I'm like, if I put her in the middle of Kansas and she doesn't have a car and she's hiding from her ex-girlfriend, that's motivation enough to keep her in that location. And yeah. then by the time by the time stuff really starts to hit the, the fan is basically it's too late. The ghost the ghost element has already started to play. 
And, yeah. and I mean, she clearly communicates to her son. We have nowhere else to go. Right. And so, exactly. I mean, you, you were very clear right. about the motivation right. for them staying in that house. But Absolutely. a lot of the times I watch a haunted house movie and I'm always kind of questioning. I'm like, you know, the second that happened, I'd be moving or at least getting, a, out of getting there. a hotel yeah. and getting my family out of there. It's so. that classic horror movie thing. Yeah. Right, how much right, do you right. explain? How much? Exactly. I get it. Right. I get right. It. So, yeah, I mean, it is a lot of locations. How did you uh, manage those company moves? I mean, were, were you a pretty lean crew or how did you do that? We were able to keep the crew, um, I think maybe to, to 15 and under. I mean, it was 15 people max. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, we shot uh, the diner one day, gas station one day, uh, country roads another day, and then um, the rest of the time we were just in Topeka and the hotel was in downtown Topeka. So we had maybe a 20 minute uh, company move or drive to the to the location. The great thing about the location is we could leave everything set up. You know, that's one of the things that when you're doing an independent film, you have to kind of contemplate, OK, do I have time to tear down everything and get to the next location or, you know, you shoot at a location for 10 hours and then you have to build in two hours into your schedule to pull everything down and put it back in the grip truck. In this case, we were like, we can live at this location for the duration of the shoot. So and we could put stuff in the ceiling because she was going to be redoing the ceiling anyway. What Where it got tricky was we had that really rundown looking kitchen, right, where everything looks like it's been torn out. I had written a scene that involved a sink. And then we showed up the, for the first day of filming. And at that point, the sink had been torn out. Uh, so I'm like, all right, well, I got to I got to think of my toes here. So I came up with an alternative scene that actually was, I think, works better. Um, the scene where she gets choked at the dinner table. Originally, mm. she was at a sink doing the dishes and there was a lot more uh, stuff happening. And it, it would have been a little bit harder to film, but I think it goes well. It's a nice um, parallel to her choking at the table with her mom standing behind her in the flashback. Yeah. So it actually ended up being one of those happy accidents that worked out. Um, the other thing was that she was actually renovating the house as we were filming. So we were kind of do si doing where um, she'd be like, all right, well, we got construction people here working at the house till 5 p.m. And then we would get there at 5 p.m. and shoot till 5 a.m. So um, the construction workers would be leaving as we were pulling in. <laughs> and she would be like, I got to tell you, there's going to be new cabinets in the in the kitchen by the time you get here, I'm like, all right, well, we got to get the kitchen wrapped before that happens because yeah, otherwise it's not right. going to look the same. So mm -hmm. those were some things that, you know, those, and we worked it out. It ended up being perfectly fine. Um, really the biggest challenge on this movie was obviously the heat because we shot in the middle of summer. Um, there's this scene where they're doing the uh, target practice and it was a hundred in the shade. And, and, you know, obviously we're working with prop weapons and we were super, super careful with that scene, especially the fact that, you know, Adrian's the one who who fires the the gun. So we were being, you know, we were being super careful, but it was like so frustrating because no matter where we went, we weren't getting comfortable because of the sun. So yeah. Um, and and how old was Adrian? At the time, he was eight. Wow. Yeah. So I mean, I I shot with kids, and that adds a layer of complication to your shoot. Yeah, yeah. And he. It was um. It was a worry for me going into the project, but then it was so funny because it would be four in the morning he would be running circles around us and we would all be just like, you know, where's our next wind? We need more energy. And he was just like drinking Coke and just, you know, yeah. he, had, he had nonstop energy, um, which was great because it, re it required us to do overnights for some of those, for some of those scenes. Yeah. Um, Cause we, uh, with, with, with our kids, we were hamstrung by, you know, we were working with SAG. And so then we had to do limited hours and have right, the school right. teacher present. And so it, it just kind of, Right. staggers your shoot in yeah, an of course, kind of way of course of course yeah. you have to keep thinking about that while you're working you know and you can't you know so we would have to you know obviously make the call times appropriate and uh yeah um, but luckily he wasn't sag he's probably going to be soon but he wasn't at the time but um um yeah i mean that part of it wasn't particularly challenging and i've done movies where there are multiple kids and that, that gets a little bit more complicated i did mm -hmm. a, i did a family film years ago where it was a dog and kids and i'm like they tell you not to do that. And of course yeah. I ended up doing it. I did that um, too. I understand. Yeah. 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 But um, the crew was great. I use the same DP for a lot of my, my films. So 
Yeah. So speaking of your, of your DP, how do you approach shooting? You know, I'm always curious how other directors work. And so when, when you plan your shoot, um, what do you do? Do you have shot lists, overhead storyboards? Like what, what do you do to plan? I normally storyboard. Um, I normally hand draw all my storyboards, which is super tedious. Um, and on for nail biter, which was a film I, I, that got released in like 2012, I had like a wall to be filmed inside of a, of a cellar of a factory, even though we were trying to make it look like a farmhouse. And I had a wall of storyboards that I would just X off each shot that we got so I could keep track. Um, helps the, was, helps the, the accrue, you know, yeah, it's there everybody can set, see that it. really helps. Everybody yeah. can see it. Um, I think, I don't know. We we've worked together for so long, this particular crew here in Kansas city, that there's a little bit of like a shorthand with everybody now. Um, I only did shot lists on this movie because I had it all in my head and I knew that it wasn't super complicated in terms of like there was there was some obviously some makeup moments that were complicated. But this movie, I just did shot lists. And then he and I usually spend three or four days going to each location. And he makes like an overhead like diagram of where all the lights are going to go. Gotcha. Um, so that's usually our workflow. Um, and it was obviously because we had maybe four or five locations at, at the most, we spent a very, a couple of days at the house going through each scene and kind of breaking it down and figuring out, okay, what are the challenges that we're going to run into in each room? Um, you know, he needed to see where the, where the windows were going to be and what we had to figure out what scenes we could block the windows so we could fake nighttime and what scenes we absolutely had to shoot at night. Um, there's that scene in the film where Lori, uh, Lori plays the character, um, and of of Judith and she's hiding behind a tree. It's so great to be able to talk about this when people have already watched the movie because I don't feel like I'm spoiling anything. And it was a thunderstorm. And I mean, we had to be very, very careful because we had lights and it was a torrential downpour. So we literally we all had our our phone apps with watching the storm to try to figure out, okay, we have 20 minutes that we can run out there and grab those shots. Um, but because we did so much planning with shot lists and and you can kind of, you know, deal with some of those problems as they come. I, I kind of feel mm -hmm. like, you know, having a lot of prep allows you to take on any type of curveballs you might be thrown, you know, while you're shooting. Because, you know, it always something always happens. You're like, well, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> you know, and one of the biggest challenges was the gas station scene. We couldn't close the gas station when we were filming. I mean, there was just no financial way we could do it. Mm, we were mm. filming that scene where she's walking outside and she, you know, takes on the two guys that are whistling at her and stuff. Right. People in the town started pulling up to the, to the pumps and filming us while we were doing it. The problem, the only problem with that, I was fine with it for the most <laughs> part until we started doing the reverse shots on her. Yeah. And I'm like, there's a different car in the pump each take. So I'm like, I can only, you know, so finally we had to block off some pumps and say, can you guys, if you're going to watch, can you be at these pumps? Yeah. Um, but those are the kind of the things where you're like, all right, we'll, we'll deal with those, those issues the day of, and we were fine. And um, so the, those overhead uh, lighting designs that are put together by your DP on the locations that you're living on, that yeah. you could stay in. Yeah. Did you put up lights to where you're lit every direction? Or did you always shoot one direction out and then shoot the other direction? He would, he, he would, if it was a scene, he would light everything so we could shoot every direction. Okay. And would you leave That's it? Nice. It would depend. Honestly, he would leave it and it would depend where we were starting the next day. If there was some overlap, for instance, if we were in the living room where there was the fire, there's the fireplace. If we were ending that day and starting you yeah. know, there that day, he would leave things set up. And so did that did did that allow your actors to do some of the scenes sequentially? Mm -hmm. Yes, some of them, some of them, especially if yeah. they you know, if they involve makeup and stuff like that. But there were some scenes where we're like, um, we just have to like the seller. We just wanted to get in and out. we wanted to get that stuff done. So we shot all the seller stuff in one day um, mm -hmm. just to get it done because nobody wanted to keep going. And it was on a different floor. Everything else was on us on the main floor, so it was easy to move lights around uh, from room to room. But that was downstairs in the cellar, and obviously people didn't know what was down there, what was living there, down there at the time. So everybody just wanted to get those <laughs> shots. Um, and every, it was so funny because I was hiding behind the air conditioner down there, 
through all of those scenes. And I had a walkie because my audio guy was upstairs and no, because we had only enough room to get an AC, a cameraman and the actors, and then me cowering behind something to get those scenes shot. Cause it was very close quarters. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, it was, I, I didn't feel rushed despite having a 12 day schedule. And I think a lot of that comes down to, casting the movie correctly we i, I mm -hmm. have written this movie specifically for this actress um, got it it's never a question in my mind that i was going to cast sarah she was always the person i wrote she was the person i wrote the script for because i had done several short films with her and so i had her in mind for this particular film that's and, nice and that's, so that, that's nice to have that shorthand because right there's that there's always that feeling going into a film with anybody new whether right. it's an actor right. Or a crew person where you're like, I hope this works out. Well, and so it's, it's really nice when you have that relationship already. Right. And Lori, I had known, I had known Lori for maybe 15 years and not cast her in anything. And she had since moved. I, I went to the University of Kansas in Lawrence, Kansas. That's where I went to film school. So I shot a lot of my films there. And she was always in that, you know, the, the, the KU film, you know, uh, group. And so um, she messaged me and she's like, when are you going to write something for me? <laughs> and it was funny because when I wrote the character of Judith, I had no actress in mind at the time. And then I had her read for it. I was like, you nailed it. You're, I'm going to cast you. And it was funny because she actually was in that Father of the Bride on Disney Plus, And she had wrapped Father of the B Bride the day before she arrived in uh, Kansas to shoot. Her very first day was the gas station. So mm -hmm. literally she like... Wrapped on a father bride, hopped on a plane and flew into Kansas City and then got to set. So, wow. um, but yeah, she was excellent. And then, of course, uh, Paige Maria, who plays the best friend. I had not I had no idea who she was. She just kind of uh, popped up on our radar through a local Kansas City uh, talent agency called Moxie. And she auditioned for us. And I was like, she's perfect. She had like a Ray Dong Chong quality about her, you know, yeah. I, thought, I thought she was great and nobody had cast her in anything yet here in Kansas City because I didn't want to use a lot of the same people that we'd used in the past. And so she kind of blew me away. And obviously, uh, Patrick McGee blew me away um, with with playing Adrian. So I was lucky because I knew once I got those four people cast and if they were really good, it was going to be pretty straightforward from there the only thing that was going to be a challenge obviously was going to be whatever technical challenges came our way or you know weather you can't control weather no matter what you do mm -hmm. so um True. especially in, especially in kansas it was like we were shooting during tornado season and i'm like thankfully we had one thunderstorm and that was obviously during the scene where uh judith is hiding behind the tree we had one thunderstorm that night and we just kind of had to make it work because we had to get that scene shot that night, at least before sunrise. So um, it came, there just came a point where we were like, we have to get this scene done today. <laughs> so, um, and obviously the makeup took a lot of time. Um, so I don't want to give any, you know, obviously you've seen the movie already, um, but obviously there's some twists towards the end. And yeah. um, the actress who plays the the, the ghost, poor, poor, poor girl, she was such a trooper. Um, because she was completely blind with those contacts that she has to wear. Mm -hmm. So we had to walk her very carefully to where her shot was going to be set up and all that. So um, so the makeup was very uncomfortable, but she never complained. She was awesome. Um, but it was just one of those things where we, that specific day that we were doing those makeup scenes, I had to shoot other things while the makeup guy was putting her in makeup and I had to have things scheduled out so that I wasn't wasting any time. I was getting other shots done yeah. while makeup was happening. So yeah. by the time the makeup was done, I was on ready for that shot and mm -hmm. we could put her in. So um, yeah, yeah, you seem like you're very experienced. You, you know, your experience may be alone, unless you've had a lot of AD experience has led you to being someone that has a very calculated mind and you seem right, very right in charge of the schedule yeah like i actually i'm guys. very involved with the scheduling i've done schedules um for independent films a lot and i usually do all, most of my own scheduling along with whoever is going to be the you know the the production manager or coordinator um we go back and forth and i'm always kind of like because i'm i'm the only one who knows how many shots i can i have for those scenes you know True. I, I, True. I go out i break out the scenes into, into shots and 
And if they're if they put too many scenes on one day, I'm like, look, that's going to be that's not going to be that's too too insurmountable for that particular day. So we have to find ways to move things around. And luckily, there were a couple of scenes in the screenplay that I cut out right before we shot. Because I was like, OK, ultimately, this doesn't push the story along and I'm going to end up cutting these out in the edit. So we might as well just not shoot those scenes. So yeah. um, so I ended up deleting a couple of scenes beforehand um, that we were able to eliminate off the schedule. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, it, it was um, a very tight ship. Megan did it. Megan did a great job producing. And ultimately, I always tell people, if you have good catering, usually your crew is very That good helps. Catering. You know, helps avoid um, a mutiny. That and coffee. You have to have yeah, caffeine. And coffee, and good and food. exactly. Yeah. Um, and uh, we were filming on a farm, so there were ticks and mosquitoes, and aye, aye, aye. Uh, so we were, you know, everybody was coming back to the hotel and finding ticks all over them and stuff. Um, so, so switching to the thematics of the movies, um, you know, and I, I'm just comparing. Maybe it's a bad comparison, but I, I, I viewed I am Lisa, and I viewed this film. And so I, I saw some common links that sure. I don't know how prevalent they are in the rest of your work. I'm interested to get into the rest of your work and see for myself. Sure. But, uh, but in this case, you know, both lead protagonists are dealing with a trauma from the past sure. involving their mothers, yeah. which is interesting. And so is that something that you were consciously aware of? I, I don't think necessarily I was... I that was something I wasn't necessarily conscious about, but I think that one thing I'm very into, and if you look at some of my other features, they all have female protagonists. They're like the main characters are women. And I find that that's, yeah, it's more interesting. It's more compelling. And so um, I didn't write, I am Lisa. I was hired to direct it. It was funny because it was one of those mm. things that fell into place. Um, and the writer approached me and I was like, Oh, I like this concept. And, and, yeah. what, but what I liked about, that movie was that we decided to make all the villains women. And so I just like that idea of, of a primarily female cast. Um, I just think it's, it's more interesting. And so I think that that was kind of the biggest comparison between. Yeah. The Cause they, they, they both have female protagonists and they're both about the relationship between a mother and her child in a way. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's interesting. so, so you must've been drawn to that. Yeah. And, uh, and, and in both cases, you know, usually in these types of films, because both of them have this, um, I don't want to say rape revenge because there's no rape, but there there is this kind of revenge, yeah. you know, dimension to both yeah. of those films. And there is a violent tension that I noticed in both yeah. that often seem to have sexual undertones, but no actual sex. Yeah. And usually in these types of films the male is the aggressor but in both cases here although there's some aggressive males the lead aggressor is female yeah yeah and, and I so think, it's interesting to me it, that it you maybe that i again like uh, um i think with with they wait in the dark some of that stuff i was just like i just want i want these characters i want this movie to be female driven and mm -hmm. so some of that stuff just kind of resulted from me insisting on having female protagonists and antagonists in the story um but yeah that was one thing that drew me to i am lisa because i was like all right well I, people have seen this story before but not necessarily with the main villain being female and and you know so I, that part of it was interesting to me um and i think you know um yeah and i get what you're saying about there being like this underlining sexual tension without there being overtly anything anything to do with sex in the film so yeah um yeah, it's interesting. And I I was writing this movie. It's so funny because I was writing this movie and I had CNN playing at the same time. And I don't know if some of that, some of like news events were seeping into my mind as well while I was I was writing it. Um, but I, you know, I came in writing this movie. I had a clear idea of I wanted it to be female driven. I wanted it to have an LGBTQ aspect to it. Um, and I wanted it to be a, a haunted house movie that had somewhat of a different take. That maybe we haven't seen before um and i kind of feel like i am lisa has a little bit of that too where it's it's kind of a, a story that we've seen before but maybe in a different maybe a slightly different vantage point you know mm. and so that's what i'm trying to do with each project that I, I i take on is to try to find something that you know everything's been done it's yeah. just now you can find a way to do it in a way that might have a little bit of a fresh spin
Sure, it makes it more fresh. Sure. And, and, and I'm, I'm curious about this because I ran into this. Has anyone ever warned you that your protagonist is unlikable? I'm, I'm wondering, you know, it's, it's something that Hollywood is particularly obsessed with. And I wanted to get your take on that. Uh, not yet. Not, not really. No, no. Um, no, I think in the case of I and Lisa, I think our, the um, uh, actress who plays Lisa is super likable to the point. I mean, she's, she's super likable. Um, and I think Sarah's likable too, but you can feel that there's an edge to her. And I mm -hmm. think that's, I think yeah. that's okay. I think that's okay. Um, and obviously with some twists and turns and, and such with the film, um, it all makes sense. But um, uh yeah, I've just, you know, for me, Sarah's was one of the easiest actresses I've had to work with. She just always brings it and and she does a, a fantastic job. And and um I keep waiting to see her get cast on a, in a major Hollywood movie at this point. So um, but uh, she's excellent to work with and and um but I haven't had anyone tell me they're unlikable yet. I mean it's okay, obviously, if they say that Lori's character is unlikable, but um Nobody said anything to me yet about it. So Douglas says we have time for one more question, and then he's kicking me off the stage here. But so uh, I, I thought I'd get into something that is kind of a taboo question, but that other okay. filmmakers would be interested in. You know, you're, you're very prolific. And so I'm wondering, um, how do you finance your work, and does it pay for your living? Because I think uh, a lot of indie filmmakers and writers right, struggle right. with those things, myself included. Yeah, you know, for me, I always tell people, be good at multiple aspects of filmmaking like i am able to uh produce i'm editing a project right now that's that's paying me like always have other things that you can be doing not just directing i'm a writer i'm you know so there are all these different aspects um to the process that i know that that make me more marketable i guess than just you know just being a director so i'm able to make it work and um and you know i'm i feel lucky that i've been able to make it work this long i graduated from ku in 2002 and i, I haven't had a full-time real full-time job since i've just been doing jumping from project to project and making it work whether it be freelance and it, it's it's you know it's a combination of finding editing jobs and maybe a, a working on a commercial or a, another shoot as a producer there are other things that that you can utilize your skill set for because it takes time raising the money for these movies. And it's always different. I always tell people raising film money for films. Uh, and in, in the case of this movie, They Wait in the Dark, the financing came from a producer that I had befriended years and years ago. So those, those you know, it's just, it comes from a relationship that I've been building on for so, for so long. Mm -hmm. um, and then in the case of like other movies, it could be an inheritance that the money comes from. There's, it's just a different, it's always different, you know? And sometimes I, I make short films too. In fact, most of my 72 credits are short films, but, but it's one of those things where, you know, people are like, I want something uh, that I can be the lead in. Can you write me a 10 minute short? I will finance it. It could be something as simple as that. Got um, it. But I think ultimately the secret is to don't be afraid to talk to people and, you know, you meet one person who then leads you to another person who might know this person. And it's just like, that's the thing. I think you can't wait for the money to just fall out of the sky. You have to be able to communicate with people. You have to, uh, uh, you know, obviously during the pandemic, it was difficult. So you had to do everything over social media or emails or whatever, but, you know, go to film events, talk to people, go to film festivals, make friends because you just never know 10 years down the road who might end up, becoming a producer or a financer on a film. And ultimately, I always tell people, don't be a jerk. I think that's the biggest thing I always tell people. Don't be a jerk. Because, you, you know, it's a small community. So, I, mean, I run into people that I worked on this movie on that they know this person. And it's like, you just right. got to be able to uh, maintain relationships so that uh, you keep a good you know, reputation. Very wise, very wise. Well, congrats on your film, Patrick. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Great speaking with you today. Hope everybody sees your movie, Everybody on Earth. And uh, thanks for sharing your time with me today. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Thanks.